It's a case that has baffled family, friends, and relatives of Joanne Matuk Romaine for 14 years. Did the 55-year-old mother really walk into Lake St. Clair and kill herself? Or did something more sinister happen? We're going to take a deep dive into this case and take a close look at what Joanne really meant when she said, if anything ever happens to me. Also, a new twist. A witness is dead. His family is speaking out for the very first time. Sometimes the secrets of a small town can make your heart stop. And she goes, if something ever happens to me, look to him. A local mother reportedly walks into the icy waters of Lake St. Clair and kills herself. The first clues at the scene showed a single set of footprints across from the car into the water. Police say it was suicide. I believe firmly that this is a murder. But why? You know, she walked in on something, she heard something she shouldn't have known. Signs of a struggle kept quiet. Questionable police practices. It's perplexing that a car left in the parking lot of a church you know, in the aftermath of a church service would raise the alarms of a police officer just on his nightly rounds. Mysterious missing keys suddenly reappear and evidence collected donated to charity. It was so out of typical police procedure that, it, that that alone is suspicious. A community on edge. Two police departments find themselves in a lawsuit because of the way the case was handled. He said the interviews of those individuals, basically to, to clear them. I, I, I said, we, we don't clear people. And now, for the first time, the man at the center of the controversy related to Joanne Matuk Romaine's death comes forward. This is just a pure and simple evil witch hunt. He sits down for an exclusive one-on-one. -on -one. Did you threaten Joanne? Face to face. I do have to ask about that phone call mm -hmm. because that's where this whole story starts. Yep. Never before seen documents. Tells the whole story for me. This quiet little community has no idea what's about to be revealed. And you say I'm being followed and all of a sudden she's missing? Yeah, you're not paranoid. You thought the story was over? It begins right now on Dateline Detroit, Secrets of a Small Town. It was 11 years ago, police say Joanne Matuk Romaine walked into Lake St. Clair and killed herself. The case is still open. Her family believes she was murdered. Tonight, a closer look at this mystery. Why are there so many unanswered questions? And why, when you want to talk to people about this case, so many are afraid or worried to share what they know. Sometimes it's the quiet, small communities that hold the deepest, darkest secrets. Is it just because they want Gross Point Farms to be this, this, uh, this safe haven of, of beauty and crime free utopia? It's a mystery that has haunted Gross Point Farms. I firmly believe they were her finger or her footprints. And Gross Point Woods for more than a decade. What happened to the mother of three, Joanne Matuk? It remains one of the area's biggest mysteries. What happened to 55-year-old Joanne Matuk Romaine? If you're like many, you were made first aware of her story January 12, 2010. Joanne's car was discovered in her church parking lot near the water's edge. When Gross Point Farms police reported the 55-year-old mother walked out of her evening church service at St. Paul's, walked across the street, and walked into Lake St. Clair and killed herself on that cold and blustery evening. Her body would be found 70 days later, washed up in Canada. 
Joanne Matuk's story got the attention of the press, but didn't take center stage. Media typically doesn't report much on suicides. Police say it's suicide. Then there was word that Joanne Matuk was paranoid, depressed. The public seemed satisfied with that explanation, but her family knew that was far from the truth. And say you can describe something as paranoid or whatever, but when it's something real and you come to find out that it actually is real and you say I'm being followed and all of a sudden she's missing, yeah, you're not paranoid. Kelly Romaine, Joanne's knew. daughter, Joanne remembers what her mother told her shortly before she died. And said, you know, if something ever happens to me, to look at him. When she said that, what did you think? And that's when all the craziness really started to happen. To try and understand what was going on in Joanne's life on that frigid Tuesday evening back in 2010, you first need to know more about the 55-year-old mother. Joanne was born and raised in Gross Point Woods. Her childhood spent in this home on Anita Street. She married David Romaine in 1980. They had three children, Kelly, Michelle, and Michael. She was very strong in her faith, um, in her family. You know, her family was her everything. Her kids were her everything. The Romaine children were raised in this home on Hidden Lane in Gross Point Woods, a home filled with so many memories, birthday parties, lots of family dinners and get-togethers with friends. She was even everyone's second mom, like she just was the most loving, caring person you could ever come across. The Romains had a happy life in their upper class community, but 25 years into their marriage, the couple separated. She was a little lady, but she was strong. Joanne moved in with her daughters. She kept herself busy with a part-time job and many trips to church. She knew where all the services were. She would regularly go to church once a week, sometimes two or three times. You know, there, she always knew where there, there was a shorter service or a full service, or she, she, you know, she knew where she could pop in. St. Paul on the Lake in Gross Point Farms was one of the places you could regularly find Joanne, frequently stopping in for a quick prayer service. This is where she was on the evening of her disappearance, attending a 7 p.m. prayer service. According to investigative reports, at 7.20, a witness saw Joanne exit the church. A minute later, another witness at the church said she heard a car alarm go off. She looked. It was Alexis. Joanne drove Alexis. According to police reports, a third witness saw something strange at 7.50. A man who seemed out of place, wearing a lightweight coat and scarf, running strangely along the lakeside of Lakeshore Drive. Police would later find that scarf here on Lakeshore Drive. According to police records, put it into evidence and then later donate it to charity. Just one of the questionable police practices you'll see as we go through this mystery. Meantime, Kelly and Michelle Romaine got home about nine o'clock after eating dinner out. They wondered why their mother wasn't home yet. It's like a calling her, We're like, okay, she's not answering. Maybe their mom turned off the phone in church, they thought, but worry started to grow. That's strange, she would have called us if she went somewhere with her friends. And I saw lights coming around the corner. I was like, oh, it must be mom. And I look out the window and it's a cop car. The cop pulled up our house at 9.24 p.m. How do you know it's 9.24? Because you instantly looked at my phone to see. So I walk outside and I walk up to the cop car and I say, can I help you? And he said, um, we found your mom's car abandoned in the church parking lot. Is she missing? And then I thought to myself, how would he know she's driving that car? It's registered to me, so if you ran a license plate, you'd be looking for me, not my mom. So right away, I know something's off, something's wrong. Then the daughters wondered, why would police consider their mom missing after just a couple of hours of her car sitting in a church parking lot? No police department in any city in all over the world is going to, after two hours, come to your house after a car is parked somewhere and ask if somebody is missing that was driving that vehicle. It's just not gonna happen. An all out search for Joanne Matuk Romaine began that night. All police were working from was the fact that her car was left in the parking lot. You think you've got questions now? Wait until you see what happens next. Coming up, Joanne's daughters start calling their mother's cell phone Police tell the daughters to stay at the house and wait for their mom. The daughters don't listen and head to the church on the lake. And what they see is hard for them to believe.
but we hadn't reported her missing. She wasn't missing to us, so how is all of this going on? And they're telling us that she's in the water. We go, no, she's not. Why did you say no, she's not? What happened to the 55-year-old mother of three? Could someone have been after her? Why get rid of Joanne Matute? Because she knew too much. More on the missing mother mystery. And later on Dateline Detroit, Secrets of a Small Town. Breaking his silence on his relationship with his cousin, Joanne. Did you threaten Joanne? Absolutely not. Did you ever threaten Joanne? Never. Never. I no reason to. I like Joanne. Tim Atu comes forward, sharing details of what he was doing the night Joanne went missing. When we come back. never been reported missing? That's the question that's been asked for some 11 years in the case of Joanne Matuk Romaine. It was back in January of 2010. Joanne came here for a church service. About an hour after the service ended, police saw her car in the parking lot. They grew suspicious and started to investigate. They contacted her daughters. Her daughters at first said they weren't worried. They never reported her missing. <laughs> Moments later, Kelly and Michelle frantically started calling their mom's cell phone. No answer. They decided, against police advice, to head to St. Paul on the Lake Catholic Church. It looked like a straight out of a movie scene. Bright lights, chaos, and a full-fledged crime scene greeted them as they approached the church that night. It was a search for a missing person who was never reported missing. As we're driving up Lakeshore, there's a helicopter circling the water with a spotlight. There's caution tape surrounding the vehicle. There's officers all around, like a crime scene, but we hadn't reported her missing. She wasn't missing to us, so how is all of this going on? They're telling us that she's in the water. We go, no, she's not. Why did you say no, she's not? Not our mom. Our mom would never be in the water. She did not like the water. To understand how we got here, we need to rewind a few hours. This is Lieutenant Andrew Rogers in a tape deposition. He is from Gross Point Farms Police. Lieutenant Rogers was the first to spot Joanne's car in the church parking lot that night. He ran the plates at 858, but deemed no action was necessary. Do you know if there were any footprints leading from that car? To the I did not see any footprints leading from the car across the roadway. According to testimony, about an hour later, Gross Point Farms police officer Keith Colombo came on scene, ran a second lien on the car at 958. The Lexus had been in the lot now for about two and a half hours after the church service. Across the Lakeshore Drive, I saw imprints uh, in the uh, snow in the basement. How far away from the vehicle were those footprints? 75 feet. Colombo testified he went to the lakefront and did not see any return footprints from the water's edge. I believe that there was somebody uh, in the water. And that is when Colombo said the investigation into the disappearance of Joanne Matuk began. Why in the world the police somehow made this conclusion within five minutes? They see a car parked in a church. No footprints going from the car to the water, but some, something apparently gives them the impetus to look 150 feet away in a snowbank by the lake. The absurdity of coming up with that conclusion within five minutes without a person being reported missing, without doing an investigation into whether or not she was missing. Now I want to show you the scene, minus the snow of course. According to police, Joanne Matuk left the church crossed the street, and then came here to this embankment. She would have to crawl over huge slabs of concrete and over barriers into the water. Now remember, back in 2010, Lake St. Clair was much more shallow. She would have to walk two football fields long into the water in her high heels to reach a level where she would drown herself. And in order to jump in the water to kill herself, she would have had to negotiate the type of obstacles that I think would be difficult for a, uh, you know, someone in the military, let alone a 
four foot ten, two hundred and fifty pound uh, housewife that is not in peak physical condition and is wearing high heels. Scott Bernstein is an author, historian, and investigative reporter. I mainly work on stories and investigations that involve organized crime and uh, mob hits. The death of Joanne Matuk sparked his curiosity. This is clearly not a suicide and that this is a homicide and needs to be treated as such. One big issue of concern, the time police arrived at Joanne's home. The daughters say it was 924. Minutes later, they started frantically calling their mom. If you look at my client's phone records, those phone calls take place between 930 and 945, not between 1030 and 1045. Leaves you wondering, how could police arrive at an address 30 minutes before the car lien was run that caused all the suspicion? Remember, Officer Colombo ran the lien at 958, and that's when he said, under oath, the investigation began. It leaves a lot of questions, and, and it kicks this, in my opinion, this whole sprawling conspiracy off quite dubiously. Now, to another questionable timeline. According to U.S. Coast Guard records, Gross Point Farms Police contacted the Coast Guard at 930. Now, you're looking at the Coast Guard records that are kept in Zulu time, which translates to 930 that time of year. The crew was launched at 938 and arrived on scene at 951, there to search for the missing mother. But if you follow the police timeline, the Coast Guard records would seem to be impossible. Remember, police said they arrived at the house at 1024 after they ran the lien at 958. It leaves you wondering, how then would the Coast Guard be notified at 930 a search was needed? Something isn't adding up. A conspiracy? Bad record keeping? Well, actually, it could be bad record keeping. Handwritten reports state the Coast Guard was first called at 1035. So you have two different reports from one agency reporting two different times. Oh, just wait, there's more. Coming up next on Dateline Detroit, secrets of a small town. 70 days later, Joanne's body is washed ashore in Canada, found by some fishermen. Her clothes and shoes giving some strange clues to what may have happened to her. Of How is she full body clothed, shoes impeccable condition, clothing in, in impeccable condition? It's just not gonna happen. Her body was placed in the water somewhere near that area. The autopsy reports leaving as many questions as answers. As we discover, Joanne died with no water in her lungs. And I don't feel like you need to be Ben Casey or Perry Mason or a character on Law and Order SVU or CSI to come to the conclusion that this is not a suicide. This is clearly not a suicide and that this is a homicide and needs to be treated as such. Murder or suicide? That's the question that has been asked for 11 years in the death of Joanne Matuk. Her body was found in the Detroit River. The case is still open. No one has been charged or arrested. But there is a person at the center of controversy in Joanne's death, her cousin, Tim Matuk. Who would want a 55-year-old housewife dead? It remains one of the area's biggest mysteries. What happened to 55-year-old Joanne Matuk Romaine? Police believe Joanne Matuk killed herself. Her family believes something more sinister happened to this mom of three. They've reported their allegations to police in their civil lawsuit and sharing them with us now. And she goes, if something ever happens to me, look to him. We're like, that's a strange thing to say. Yeah. Kelly and Michelle Romaine recall the conversation they had with their mother in mid-December of 2009. They told police her mother was talking to her cousin Tim Matuk on the phone that day while they were in the room. We all of a sudden just hear yelling, like, at this person. We're like, well, what the heck's going on? And she's like, you need to, she, I never said you were the root of everyone's problems. I told you to keep your nose out of everyone's business. Joanne hung up, giving that warning. You know, if something happens, look to Tim. Michelle said her mother never gave her specific details 
but was worried. That's when all the craziness really started to happen. What kind of crazy? Like she was being followed. Joanne shared her fears of her cousin Tim to others as well. According to this affidavit filed in the civil case, paralegal Nancy Barish said Joanne told her, Tim Matuk said to me, if someone wanted to get rid of you, they could do it and you would never be found. She was kind of planting that seed because she was fearful. I think she didn't want us to know as her children how scared she truly was or she didn't want us to be in danger either. Or going to her paralegal and saying he threatened to make me disappear and told me, you know, nobody would ever know what happened to me, which is, is kind of odd because that's exactly what's happened here. She disappeared, she's dead, and nobody really knows what happened. So who is Tim Matuk? He was a Harper Woods police officer at the time of Joanne's disappearance, now works as an investigator with the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. More on Tim in a moment, but first, let's give you a little family history. Matuk family drama started years ago when after Joanne's parents died and left money for their children, the sibling war began. Two sides divided. That's, that's when the division started to happen. So. And from what we've learned, much of the controversy was over the fact Joanne continually helped and supported her brother John. I was very close with her. I talked to her three or four times a day. John Matuk has made headlines himself, at one point landing on Crane's 40 under 40 list for his business accomplishments. He also made news when he was convicted of writing checks with insufficient funds, as well as false pretenses. Despite John's troubles, Joanne stayed close with her brother. That was the closest to my sister, I mean, other than her, her three children. She wouldn't tell me that conversation that she had with Tim and two. And all she kept saying was, we need to go to the cops, we need to go to the cops. To he to the too cops. believes his sister's death is suspicious. He remembers arriving to the scene at the church that night she went missing and recalls his conversation with police. And he said, what is going on here? You, got, you guys saw footprints going to the lake on the, on the pavement, but the pavement didn't have any snow on it. That's when I thought, there's, a, there's an issue. There's a major issue. She never walked into that water, never. That was a stage crime scene in front of that church. The whole thing was botched. Now, let's get back to two weeks before Joanne died. In hopes of smoothing things over, Michelle says her mother went to talk to her brother Bill about that phone call with Tim to try to stop the family fighting. The daughter's story of what happened that day was reported to police. Yeah, I drove her to the store and she's like, I'm just going to go in and and talk to my brother, even though they they had an estranged relationship. She didn't talk to him often at all. Um, she's like, I'm gonna go tell him about Tim and how he called. And she came out more freaked out than she was when she went in. She wouldn't say what the conversation was about. She just wanted to go to church and pray. In a court deposition, Joanne's brother, Bill, yeah. describes a much different encounter that day. I just wanted to make things right. We. Um uh, haven't talked to you in a long time. I feel bad about everything. Um, um, it's about it, you know, I want to make amends. She said, um, you know, you talked to cousin Tim and you shouldn't trust him. I said, why? I said, he's a good guy. Why shouldn't I trust him? I got no reason not to. I mean, what's, we're, I kept telling, explaining to her, like, we come in and we visit. What's the trust factor? We're not in business together or anything like that. I said, he's just my family. And, so I, I told her, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing not to trust him about. And how long did that meeting last about? Probably a, a minute or two. Under oath, Tim Matuk testified he never threatened his cousin Joanne. I said, Joanne, why would you tell people that I am the reason why John's got so many problems? Her response to me was, you're just nothing but a big troublemaker. I don't even want to talk to you. And she hung up the phone. Did you at any point in time in your life ever express or imply to Joanne Matuk Romaine that you would have her disappear? No. So why all this attention on Tim Matuk? Well, besides what Joanne allegedly told her daughters and the paralegal, there is an eyewitness whose statement, if believed, puts Tim at the scene of Joanne's disappearance that cold January night back in 2010. 
After learning about Joanne Matuk's disappearance, Paul Hawk came here to the Gross Point Farms Police Department to share what he says he experienced on Lakeshore Drive that night. Police did not deem him credible and didn't share his statement. That is, until the Romaine family sued the police department for access to the reports on their mother's case. This is the affidavit that was filed in the civil case from Paul Hawk. He stated on the night of January 12, 2010, he was traveling north on Lakeshore Drive. He observed a heavyset woman with dark hair, dressed in all black clothing, sitting on the break wall of Lake St. Clair. She was sitting still, motionless, and was slightly slumped over. He became concerned and suspicious. Hawk goes on to state, I further observed two vehicles parked illegally in the road. I observed two men standing near each of the cars. According to Hawk's statement, one of the men motioned for me to drive through. Hawk stated he went to Gross Point Farms Police, met with the chief and two officers for 40 minutes, handed in a statement. Gross Point Woods Public Safety Officer Anthony Shalott interviewed Paul Hawk. Uh, I believe Mr. Hawk had a credibility issue. But Hawk wouldn't let it go. Years later, Hawk stated in the affidavit, after seeing a photograph of Timothy Matuk, I can identify with absolute certainty that he was one of the two men I saw on the side of the road January 12, 2010. Hawk's affidavit was stricken by the judge in the civil case, not allowed as evidence. Was Hawk right? Police didn't deem him credible. Now, for the first time in 11 years, Tim Matuk breaks his silence. You know, this is just a pure and simple evil witch hunt. Enough is enough. Tim Matuk says it's time to speak out on the death of his cousin and clear meantime, his name. I felt, felt like I was being maliciously prosecuted by them when they knew I was not anywhere near the church. Coming up, Tim Matuk in his own words, his alibi and his phone records from that mysterious night Joanne met missing, never shared before, until now. Fifty-five-year-old Joanne Matuk Romaine left this Gross Point Farms church on a cold night in January of 2010, never to be seen alive again. Did she have enemies? Well, according to Joanne's daughters, Joanne was fearful of her cousin, Tim Matuk, after a heated conversation they had on the phone weeks before she died. According to court records, Joanne told a paralegal, Tim Matuk said to me, if someone wanted to get rid of you, they could do it and you would never be found. According to tape depositions, Tim Matuk's name was brought to the attention of Michigan State Police after Joanne's death. So did you conduct interviews of, of Tim Matuk and the other person that was mentioned? No. And is there a reason for that? Yes, because in assessment of the case, I asked him what resources did he need. He said the interviews of those individuals, basically to, to clear them or, you know, uh, with the kid with the case or the allegations or something to that effect and the terminology that clear I, I, I said we, we don't clear people who used the term clear you or him Pazahowski did Pazahowski asked you to clear Tim Matuk yep. and this other person yeah Pachowski is Andrew Pachowski at that time head of Gross Point Woods Detective Bureau he has since become the public safety director in Huntington Woods Andrew Pachowski was unwilling to talk to me about this case. Meantime, Tim Matuk was never interviewed as a suspect in the case, never charged, but has always been a constant target of Joanne's daughters. Tonight, he's breaking his silence, talking about the accusation he killed his cousin. What made you decide you want to talk? Well, now that the lawsuits are over and there's really nothing more for me except for trying to clear my name and my reputation. I mean, they've uh, tried desperately to ruin my career. 64-year-old Tim Matuk is an investigator for Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy's office. He's worked on many notable cases. Back in 2010, Tim was a detective for Harper Woods Police. Well, I'm a hardworking family man. I've been in law enforcement for over 36 years, 37 years now. And, uh, you know, I have uh, a beautiful family. He says his image has been tarnished because of accusations of murder from Joanne Matuk Romaine's daughters. This is just a pure and simple evil witch hunt. 
So tell me about your relationship with Joanne Matuk. You know, I've always had a good relationship with Joanne Matuk. As kids growing up, she was a little bit older than me. But as we grew older and went off and got married and had families, we kind of went our separate ways, just like I did with most of the cousins. You know, I, I never knew till recently that she had an issue with me. I never thought we had an issue. That's why I made that phone call to ask her why would she go say that. Remember, we told you about that phone call Tim and Joanne had a few weeks before she died from the perspective of Joanne's daughters. Kelly and Michelle Romaine recall the conversation they had with their mother in mid-December of 2009. They told police her mother was talking to her cousin Tim Matuk on the phone that day while they were in the room. We all of a sudden just hear her yelling, like, at this person. We're like, well, what the heck's going on? And she's like, you need to, she, I never said you were the root of everyone's problems. I told you to keep your nose out of everyone's business. Joanne hung up, giving that warning. You know, if something happens, look to Tim. Michelle said her mother never gave her specific details, but was worried. I do have to ask about that phone call mm -hmm. because that's where this whole story starts. Yep. What was that phone call about? She had walked into the store that the family owned at the time and told my cousin Billy that I was the reason that John Matuk was having all these problems. For whatever reason, he would always blame me for any of his business failures. Remember, John Matuk was Joanne's brother, who was convicted of writing bad checks as well as false pretenses. I mean, I've never done nothing to her, and I've not, never done nothing to him. But apparently, their feeling was my involvement in law enforcement must have been the reason. I don't know. Other than that, I can't explain it. So when you picked up the phone and called her, why were you calling her? To ask her why she said that. And what did you say? I said, Joanne, why would you go around telling people that I'm the reason why John Matuk has so many problems? She responded, she didn't want to talk to me, and that I was a troublemaker, and she hung up the phone. I mean, the conversation couldn't have lasted more than a minute. Did you threaten Joanne? Absolutely not. Did you ever threaten Joanne? Never. Never. I know reason to. I like Joanne. Now to Joanne's death and the night she was last seen alive back in January of 2010. What were you doing that night? I was working. I was on duty working with a Michigan State Narcotics Task Force. I was in the city of Warren, Michigan. My shift started at 2 and ran till 10 o'clock that night. The police officers in the deposition admit they didn't see you that night, but they were in contact with you. Matuk says that's typical on a surveillance team. What do you say to the family who says, yes, you were working that day, but you were on a radio, no one saw you. You could be basically anywhere in the state on one of those radios. Well, it's pretty far-fetched. First off, I would never risk my job over that. I would never leave my partners vulnerable in that position. And the lieutenant on the crew, he basically knows who, who, where everybody's at and where they're supposed to be. I think I would know, you know, if someone was, you know, shirking their responsibilities or trying to sneak out. Bill Hanger was the lieutenant from Michigan State Police who oversaw Matuk's unit that night. It would be very, very difficult, almost improbable, for someone to be able to leave a surveillance because if someone left, I mean, you're counting on every person there to communicate, you know, and try and track the person as they're, as they're driving away. Matuk says his phone records from that night show he was in Warren. 21 calls made between 349 and 854 the night Joanne went missing. How important are those phone records? Very important. Tells the whole story for me. And what about that eyewitness, Paul Hawk, who identified Tim Matuk as a person near the water's edge where Joanne supposedly went in the water? I've never seen Paul Hawk in my life, and he's never seen me. Remember, Hawk's affidavit was stricken by the judge in the civil case. It wasn't until four and a half years later that he identified me from a moving car at night. 
Tim says he wants the accusations to stop. It's just a constant abuse. It's just a constant harassment. And you just, you know, at the end of the day, I want to clear my name. But remember, the case of Joanne Matuk Romaine is still not closed. From your gut, was Joanne murdered or did Joanne kill herself? You know, I mean, I've listened to so many opinions. In my opinion, there's one footprint, one set of footprints that go down to the water. That says a lot. None return. Now, whether she went down there for whatever reason and slipped and fell in, who knows? Signs of a struggle kept quiet. Questionable police practices. There's no sign, no evidence of any kind of violent crime that would warrant a DNA check. Mysterious missing keys suddenly reappear? There's definitely evidence of a cover-up here. This quiet little community has no idea what's about to be revealed. You thought the story was over? Just wait. The case of Joanne Matuk Romaine is an interesting one. There's so many questions. How police handled evidence, where her body was found. Now the case is still open, but the police agency in charge of it isn't willing to talk. As a matter of fact, just a few weeks ago, I spoke with Gross Point Farms Police Chief Jensen. He said he was considering an interview but then canceled after city attorneys told him not to speak. So let's take a look at what he said in the past. Eleven years after the disappearance and death of Joanne Matuk Romaine, there are still so many questions. So you've got a crime scene trampled all over and nothing's properly photographed or documented. That is just one of the many criticisms of the Gross Point Farms Police, coming from 25-year veteran Martin County Sheriff Detective Salvatore Restrelli. Well, the one thing I want to say about the whole investigation that they conducted up there, it was so out of typical police procedure that, it, that, that alone is suspicious. Restrelli was hired by the Romaine family to learn more about their mother's death. Joanne Matuk, who, according to police, walked into Lake St. Clair January 12th of 2010 and killed herself. Based on the investigation, more than likely it was a suicide. That's Gross Point Farms Police Chief Dan Jensen. We asked to talk to him on camera. He was not willing. So we are using his deposition in the family's civil lawsuit against the police department to help explain how and why police reacted the way they did. The first clues at the scene showed a single set of footprints across from the car into the water. Uh, sit down, slide to this next level, and into the water. We went into rescue mode. There was not one photograph that could depict a high heel shoe. There were work boots and probably, you know, the medics or the uh, policemen that were on the scene. You could see a few of their footwear impressions. None of the footwear impressions were taken with a scale in place. Every mm -hmm. death investigation that is in, in any way suspicious, an accident or what people may think is an outright suicide, has to be invested as if it's a homicide. Rastrelli says there were numerous questionable police practices. First, the idea Joanne walked to her death. I, I never believed for one minute that Joanne went down that ramp, then negotiated the broken concrete and exposed rebar without falling or getting injured and would have been found right there at the scene. Another concern, the fingerprinting of Joanne's vehicle. They brought it into their garage at their police station and they threw dust around. Well, first of all, you can't dust leather seats and vinyl seats. They're corrugated. The only way to get fingerprints off of something like that is through ex good extreme photography with lighting after you fume the interior of the car with super glue. And that was never done. And why no DNA check of the car? There's no sign, no evidence of any kind of violent crime that would warrant a DNA check. Family disagrees. Joanne's new purse was found inside that Lexus SUV. Photos show the purse was torn. Rastrelli believes the tear is consistent with someone roughly grabbing the purse as if in a struggle. During Matuk's autopsy, a bruise was found on her arm. Like when someone grabs a purse off a woman's shoulder hard enough to bruise her. 
And then there's Joanne's body, found 70 days after she disappeared by some fishermen in Amherstburg, Ontario, near Bablo Island. Her body was placed in the water somewhere near that area. It just doesn't make any sense when you examine her remains, you know, months later, where she doesn't have any of the typical things you would see on a drowning victim that would have traversed 30 miles of waterway. The detective pointed out Joanne's shoes had no signs of being scratched, scuffed, or damaged. In the Canadian autopsy report, it concludes, coroner believes that there is not enough cogent or convincing evidence that she did intend to take her life. Then there was Joanne's death, ruled a dry drowning, meaning there was no water in her lungs. With a dry drowning, that means air is in your lungs, not water, which makes you buoyant. Dr. David Smith, who is an expert in the investigation of water-related deaths and accidents, stated in his deposition, my belief that she was extremely buoyant and the documented lack of current, there is a high possibility that someone would have seen her floating. But we know crews searched and searched for Joanne that night and the following day. She could not be found. Dr. Smith also stated, where she drowned and when she drowned, I believe, are subject to discussion. There's also a question about how the police handled evidence. Remember that man witnesses said they saw running strangely by the lake the night Joanne disappeared? He reportedly had a black scarf on. According to one of the Gross Point Farms officer's depositions, It was released out of the property system in 2015. It was donated in November of 2010. Clearly bad record keeping. And remember, this case is still open. Why release evidence? Then there are Joanne's car keys. The very next day after her disappearance, keys to her car suddenly reappear at the police department. Joanne's daughters have said their mother's spare car keys went missing from their Morningside home about six weeks before Joanne's disappearance. Keys that had gone missing a month earlier. No record of where those keys came from. No record of who gave them to the police. The officer couldn't tell me anything about this, and that gave me some very serious questions as to where he really got those keys from. Questions that I don't know the answer to. But his story makes no sense. And why, since the case is open, won't the Gross Point Police Department talk? Why would you not investigate this case thoroughly enough to where you could really hang your hat on your decision? Is there a conspiracy, a cover-up, or just questionable police work? Our investigation continues coming up. Did a meeting with federal agents really occur days before Joanne died? I've had sources tell me that she actually had a meeting with the FBI. Was she paranoid? It wasn't because she had some uh, mental issue or mental disorder that was causing her to feel like that. Uh, it, it, was, it was stark reality. Coming up, find out what her doctors had to say. Basically, everything about this case is disturbing. A 55-year-old mother of three, dead, the case still open, and so many questions still more than a decade later. She was even everyone's second mom. Like, she just was the most loving, caring person you could ever come across. She loved her children, her church, and her friends. But her family says Joanne Matuk Romaine had a secret she was holding. I think that she was approached or met with somebody from the FBI. Small town secrets and a mystery that has haunted this community. I believe firmly that this is a murder. But why? She walked in on something, she heard something she shouldn't have known. Some claim Joanne Matuk was paranoid, but was she? She would come home and she was someone was following me. We said, well, who? And she's like, it's somebody different every day, but there's somebody following me. And you say I'm being followed and all of a sudden she's missing. Yeah, you're not paranoid. According to this document from Joanne's doctor, Joanne did not have any psychiatric disorders. She did not have any suicidal thoughts and she was a happy person. Another of Joanne's doctors goes on to state, her deep faith in Catholicism and her strong devotion to the welfare of her children mitigated against the risk of suicide. It wasn't because she had some uh, mental issue or mental disorder that was causing her to feel like that. Uh, it, it, was, it was stark reality. 
Scott Bernstein is an investigative reporter who typically covers mob hits. The death of Joanne Matuk Romaine captured his curiosity. I've had sources tell me that she actually had a meeting with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office in the days leading up to her disappearance. We did contact the FBI Detroit headquarters asking about that alleged meeting. An FBI spokesperson would only say they would not confirm or deny a meeting with Joanne Matuk Romaine occurred. So where do things stand in the death of this Gross Point Woods mother? The case is not closed. There's a family that still believes it wasn't what we have determined it likely to be. So I would guess out of respect for that family, if more information, new information, new credible information is presented, we would proceed accordingly. The Romaine family did file a civil suit against both Gross Point Farms and Woods Police Department and other defendants, seeking to hold them liable for claims related to the death of their mother. They lost the case not once, but also on appeal. The family holds out hope, much in part because of the judge's opinion in their case, where the judge states, there are disputed facts in this matter that are very disturbing and to this day remain unresolved. The judge also stated the plaintiff's pursuit of this lawsuit meritorious and therefore denied defendant's request for attorney's fees and costs. Basically everything about this case is disturbing. Um, her also insinuating and stating that the case that I brought forth was meritorious, but still we lost. It's unsettling. You know, there's a lot of questions. Um, you can't go back now, but what I do know is what we uncovered during the course of discovery was dynamic. There is so much information. There are so many facts and there's so many questions. What really happened that night in January of 2010 when Joanne walked out of St. Paul on the Lake Church? Time has passed. Will new information come out? You can bet her daughters will keep searching and searching for answers. And I would never give up. There's no giving up. And now, another twist and turn in the case. Paul Hawk, he's the witness who said he saw something suspicious on Lakeshore Drive that night. He's now dead. His family, for the first time, speaking out about his death. My brother Paul, who had been um, you know, involved in this case as a witness and you know, put up with a lot of pressure from the involved parties for years, you know, stood strong through all of it, you know, always told the truth, did the right thing. And, um, you know, he died unexpectedly, he was healthy. So you really believe this wasn't a natural death? I, I do. I mean, he, he was healthy as an ox, um, you know, took good care of himself. And, uh, you know, again, uh, given how much hassle he had from the supposed it involved parties. It, you know, it's hard to imagine that there wasn't something going on there. Seems like he was almost plagued by this case. It was pretty all-consuming. It, it weighed on him. It it did. And, you know, the fact that, you know, if you look at this, you know, the, the facts in the case, um, you know, the fact that police were contacting, um, you know, the family before she was even reported missing, uh, that they knew uh, it was her, even though it was somebody else's car. You know that they uh, were, you know, looking in the water before she even been reported in the water. Just you know, lots of the details of the case uh, didn't match up. And when Paul um, heard about it and he went to the police, you know, they were almost uh, you know, trying to convince him not to not to uh, do a you know citizen's report. And after he became a witness, he had everything to lose. You know, the the harassment by some of the uh, some of the people in the police force, the you know, you know, nonstop uh, you know intimidation, parking outside of his house, you know, showing up at his door, you know, just you know, phone calls. You know, it would have been easier for him to just say, "Hey, it's not my problem. I didn't know this person. It's I'm not involved." It'd be easier just to get to not be involved. Instead, um, you know, he's, he stepped forward and stayed involved for for 10 years. You know, it's uh, it's incredible for to do that for a stranger, but that's the kind of person he was. John Abood was a friend of Paul Hawk since the third grade. They saw each other one to two times a week. 
He says he was worried about his friend after Paul started sharing what he saw the night Joanne Matuk Romaine disappeared. Paul was an honest person. He wouldn't make anything up. He wouldn't embellish. And uh, his story never varied. What did he say to you about what he saw? He really didn't say much. You know, he uh, wanted to keep me out of the loop. He says it would protect me. What do you think about his death? Very sad and tragic. I lost a good friend. Yeah. It's labeled undetermined, the cause of death. What do you think about that? I don't know what to think about that. You know, people die. He was under a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. um, it was a shock. As you can imagine, there's no real closure for Joanne's children. Now, 14 years later, they still wonder what really happened after their mom walked out of this church. I caught up with Michelle recently to talk about her thoughts on this case. Do you think we would have been here 14 years later? No, I think, you know, with all the information that we have and all the evidence, you know, that there definitely should have been an arrest a long time ago. Um, but, you know, we're here and it's 14 years. Um, we're continuing to get information um, and, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, this could be the year. Paul Hawk is dead. Um, he was pivotal in this case. I know that um, police officers did not think he was pivotal. What do you think now that he's gone? Paul Hawk was extremely um, critical to this case. He knows what he saw. He never faulted on what he saw. And he, all he wanted was justice and he stood by that. Um, and I think, you know, in his honor, we should continue to fight and continue to uncover this case. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of suspicion and questions around his death. Um, and his family, his friends, everybody is suspicious of how a 55-year-old could just die. We, uh, we talked with his family, and they said that. They said he was healthy. Um, they were hesitant in the, at first talking. A lot of people are hesitant talking about this case, but they said, in their words, it was mysterious. Do you think it was mysterious? I definitely have uh, my suspicions about his death. I know that he was very fearful that something could happen to him because he was a main witness in this case. And, you know, anybody that is involved or are talking about this case is fears for themselves as well. Um, so we had yeah. interviews scheduled today and they canceled. Yes. And what did they tell you? That they fear for their lives. So they didn't want to talk to so us. So they didn't want to talk because they know the complexity of the case mm -hmm. and they know that, you know, that there is, you know, a lot of evil behind it. We're standing here. This is the church where your mom was last seen. Um, and it's 14 years later. What do you think? How do you feel? I feel that, you know, standing here today that we have fought and that we have a lot of you know, questions, I think, answered, you know, through just evidence based through courts, through witnesses, but we don't have an arrest. And that's we want justice and justice is an arrest. Somebody actually serving the consequence for her death. Why is this year hopefully going to be different? What do you think? I think that people, you know, as years go on, people have become um, fed up with what they have seen and they want this case to be solved. Um, you know, people know what happened. It's very obvious she was murdered and they want justice for my mom. How are you doing? I'm good. I mean, I'm hanging in there and I, I feel that as a daughter, I've done everything that I could possibly do, um, you know, to bring this case forward and to, to show that you know, this was not a suicide, this was a murder, and we need to continue to put that at the forefront and let the citizens of the community know that as well. Joanne Matuk Romaine, hard to believe it's been 14 years. What happened that night she walked out of the church? Suicide or something sinister? So many unanswered questions. Secrets of a small town.